the glass house, an unlimited forever of tomorrows. A short essay on time and place by Craig Warren Smith. Earlier this year, I received a letter from Gerald Manane, typed on his Remington Monarch typewriter his wife bought him in 1965. In it, he told me that he believes the concept of time does not exist, that, quote, what we call time is our confused perception of place after place. How do we interpret this sentiment, that consciousness is a series of spatial experiences that we perceive sequentially only because of our cognitive limitations and habits? Perhaps when we look back on our memories, we are not travelling back in time so much as we are visiting places in our mind, without a definite chronology. In the park across the road from where I live, there is a little building called the Glass House. It used to house flowers and ferns that were grown by gardeners employed by the local council to be then planted in beds around the park. Now it is becoming increasingly dilapidated in what could be seen as a strategic move by the powers that be to let it become an eyesore and then one day readily demolished without a fuss. That's the cynic in me talking because I adore the glass house and want it to remain in the park forever. I might employ Murnane's philosophy here to comfort me and consider that the glass house is not getting older. It is simply moving from one place into another kind of place in my mind and the mind of those in our community who give it spatial attention. The park has been undergoing redevelopments of different stripes across the decade. Ten years ago, nearly to the day, the bowling club that sat in the park was shut down and set for demolition. Today, half the park is fenced off and an old brick building that housed a giant chessboard on one side and toilets on the other began to have its roof removed. When I caught wind that plans to further renovate the park were in progress, I decided to take inspiration from a news article I read a couple of years ago in which South Sea Islanders used photogrammetry to create a structural record of significant buildings in the community. Photogrammetry is the science of extracting three-dimensional data from photographs by overlapping images of an object or space and converting them into rendered models. They look like a caramelised version of reality to me, or perhaps like a building deep-fried and then set to rest in a state of static melting. You can use most modern phones or tablets that have a LiDAR, light detecting and ranging, like Apple devices, to scan an object in this way and produce an augmented result. That's what I did in the videos you can see on this page. I now have versions of the glass house that I can walk around in a virtual capacity or even use a 3D printer to create a small model version of the house. Or I suppose print a real size version as 3D printed homes are now a thing. I've been thinking a lot about time recently, or in one space and another, and about the idea of what happens when nothing ever really comes to an end. This is what the promise of digitalization brings, like the render of the glass house in that video above. The actual building might be demolished by the time I return to the park for my next wander, but the virtual version will always remain so long as this technological age keeps on. There is something crucial about endings, though. I don't believe I would value a piece of music that never concluded, Ned Markosian's philosophical notion about the physics of sideways music might be an interesting aside here. Some years ago, I listened to a podcast episode that shared a touching story involving a girl who had a beloved grandmother who passed away and then, as a way of processing her grief, decided to recreate her grandmother in the video game The Sims. At first, it was a therapeutic way of still being able to interact and communicate with her grandmother, and the girl made sure to turn off ageing inside the game 
so her virtual grandmother would never age and never pass away. However, in time, she realised that interacting with the avatar of her grandmother in this way did not bring the happiness and relief it once did. An ending was required to give value to what she loved about her grandmother, and so she turned on the setting within the game that would allow the characters to age. Soon after, her grandmother died in the game, and this time, in a controlled and anticipated environment, the girl was able to grieve in a manner that mediated her feelings towards her grandmother, more fully than the shock of her real-life passing. I think this is a profound consideration, and one that strikes at the heart of foreverism. What do we make of a culture, a memory, with no end point? We live in an age of cinematic and narrative sequels and multiverses that promise there will always be more to the story, but this wasn't always the case. Novels and movies used to finish with no expectation of a follow-up. If you wanted the characters to keep living beyond the final scene, you needed to conjure a fantasy in your mind. There is something about the nature of ontological incompleteness that feels resonant here. Those gaps in the universe that never get filled in. As Slavoj Zizek has analogized the idea, this Hegelian breach is like a building in a video game that is never meant to be entered. It is just a decorative set piece. The building doesn't contain anything inside because it would have been a waste of the programmer's time to do so. So too, the critical gap that comes after the conclusion of a story in which the characters exist beyond the boundaries of the narrative only, exclusively in your mind, not in any actual media, with no potential to manifest into endless follow-up media timelines like the 25 years of spin-offs and bizarro merchandising and train networks and multi-timeverse narratives spawned by the Neon Genesis series. In this way, Perhaps my virtual photogrammetry of the glass house is going about things in the wrong way, trying to foreverize something that only has value because of the space it occupies in the here and now. It might be better to build some destructive code into the render so that it dissolves and fractures the binary components of the file gradually over time. Digital degradation, a virtual equivalent in the spirit of what Bansky did with his artwork shredder. Each time the video of the glass house loops, it could be a bit more glitchy and faded, like a Warhol print photocopied too many times, or just enough to signify transience. There are a number of plaques on benches in the park, placed by families, commemorating some of the lives of those who have lived in the area and now passed on. One that I saw recently was for a lady who had lived to be 106. She was born during the First World War and passed away two months ago. The memorial quote on the plaque above her name reads, Too well loved by all who knew her to ever be forgotten. It's a lovely sentiment, but I wonder if the opposite might also be true. Too loved not to be forgotten, loved so much that they are allowed to rest and fall into the unmarred oblivion of non-remembrance. It feels like the ultimate human fear, to be forgotten. That Hemingway line, that everyone has two deaths, when they are buried in the ground, and the last time, someone says their name. This feels particularly like the psychological fissure of the sort of person who seeks an earthly immortality of ego. Another quote, the name of a Damien Hirst artwork I want to know what it feels like to live forever for a while. That's life, isn't it? It feels eternal until it's not. When I walk around Newcastle and Hamilton, I frequently, on a quiet weekend morning, trespass and collect disjecta from sites I know are falling into ruin or demolition in an effort to retain fragments of history that will otherwise end up in landfill. I won't put myself in an ambiguous legal situation by detailing too much of this, 
perhaps in 10 or 20 years, I will provide a catalogue of these finds and pass them on to the local museum. But the reason I do so is surely wrapped up in these twin carriages of keeping time in a state of suspended animation and the anticipated grief of an unlimited forever of tomorrows. What was it that Nietzsche had stamped above his door, amor fati, to love one's fate, the crux of his idea for the eternal recurrence in which if one knew they would live their life again and again in the exact same way for eternity, they would choose to live in a way that made this potential the most beautiful fate imaginable. But Nietzsche intentionally conjured this idea to house the potential of a terrible curse, the threat that if one lived in a way that wasn't wonderful, they would be forced to live that mediocrity, that pity, over and over, into infinity. This foreverest trap was necessary to force a confrontation with how one might face tomorrow. The point isn't to think about how one could best live forever. The point is to recognise how not to look back. Or, to reference that line in the letter from Menain, to move from this place to another place. At the moment, the glass house is in a place that overlaps with mine, but when it doesn't, so help me, I'll be there too.